it's time to take a look at Icons of Kiev in this two to four player board game by Rizavir. This is a game that takes about 30 minutes per player and is for ages 14 and up. And in the game Icons of Kiev, you are playing as a monk in a monastery attempting to satisfy the abbot. You're going to be going around and creating icons, uh, painting and working and socializing with other monks and visiting different portions of the church. The church is basically being created, the cross has been put up by masons, and now your job is to kind of finish it off and make it look beautiful um, before the time of rest comes. And you are hopefully going to become the next spiritual leader. This is a dice slash worker placement game. You'll be gathering or drafting dice, rolling those dice, placing the dice out onto the different locations of the monastery, and then collecting either pigment or paint or gold or jewels so that you can create icons. Icons are basically uh, these different types of uh, saints that you'll be constructing and you'll be improving them on throughout the game. The game lasts seven rounds and at the end of the seventh round, you'll check to see how well you've done as you construct things and place and gather, you're going to gain victory points, and if you have the most, you're the winner. Be careful though, don't socialize too much and don't work too hard, otherwise it might cost you, especially if you start hoarding some paints and gold and jewels. All right, that's the basic idea of the game. Let's talk about the basic setup, how to play, and then of course, my review. So let's set up the game Icons of Kiev. And the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to gather the main game board and place it out within reach of all players. Then take each of the building locations and place them in the respective areas on the game board. In the rules, it explains where they go, but realistically, you can pretty much place them wherever you'd like. Uh, additionally, you're going to then go ahead and take out the three main decks of the monks, and you'll have the first, second, and third portion of the game. Take the first green deck, shuffle them up, and deal out four on the far right hand side. Then go ahead and take these uh, work tiles and place five randomly on the work board, as well as a blue die in the middle of each of them. There's a certain die pool that's going to be calculated based on the number of players. In a two-player game, you'll simply choose four of each dice and place them down on the game board. Uh, then the very bottom uh, left-hand side is going to be your die pool area, where you'll be placing a marker indicated for each of the players on the three section, and then one, I, one uh, token for each of the players on the far bottom left. You're also going to take this main uh, board here, or secondary main board, I should say. This is going to basically give you uh, the rounds of the game. There are a total of seven. You'll place the gold marker on the far left. And as rounds end and you transition to a new one, you'll place this marker over. And eventually, as you jump over certain sections of these dice, you'll gain them. Make sure that you place those dice, one of each color, in each of the areas that represents one of each color, representing the number of, uh, of rounds and dice you will gain throughout the game. Additionally, each player is going to get a marker for their victory points. Just place it on zero at the very bottom left-hand side of the game board. Now, the last thing for the main game aspect is going to be this area here. This area is going to give you basically a marker representing the different resources that you're going to uh, have and give away throughout the game. There's a phase in the game in which you're going to spend your resources uh, and you need to keep track of those. Place a gold marker in the zero section on the top and the zero section on the top right hand side and then one of each player marker in the zero section on the bottom portions of the game board. Set this aside, you'll use this in a small small portion of the game, but it is important. Lastly is your player board. You are going to be getting a reference, which is going to not only reference the different uh, spots that you can gain resources or icons of, of the types of resources that there are, and dice rolls, as well as, of course, what you need in order to build your icon. You're going to have a main game board as well. This game board is going to basically calculate your sins as well as your, uh, your virtues. You're going to have the space for your pigments for when you paint. And then you're going to have the different types of stats you can gain throughout the game. And they're listed as different things, but it's like virtue and then like hard work and then how chatty you are and then how lazy you are. Um, I'll, I'll give you the actual wording as we do explain the gameplay. But this is going to keep track of that and determine how many dice you get or how many to help you have to discard and how many steps you have to go down extra on this track here for your pigments. And uh, lastly but not least is going to be your icon. Each player is just going to get their own icon, which is going to come with two different sets of robes of the different colors, as well as the main headpiece, which I'm going to say, I'm going to butcher this, I'm sure, but it's a Gloriel. It's like the, the main character, of your, or the main saint, as well as like the portion above. And they're all kind of like in tiers. The best tier will give you the most points and the lowest tier will give you the least points. You'll set this aside, which you'll be building throughout the game. 
And that's pretty much it. The second, third, fourth players, if they're playing, are gonna get bonus help tokens. The first player will get the first player marker, and let's play some Icons of Kiev. Icons of Kiev is played over seven rounds, and each of the rounds has a turn order in which will take different phases. Uh, the first phase of the game is the dice selection phase. Players will go back and forth selecting die clockwise around the table until every player has their maximum number of dice. To determine that, you're gonna go ahead and look at this board here and find your marker, and currently at the beginning of the game, it's going to be three. So I would take a die. Callie would take a die, Bill would take a die, and we keep taking die until we have taken our max amount. After we have gathered all of our dice for the game, then we are going to move on to the resource phase. You will take the die that you have gathered and you will roll them. Once you roll them, you will calculate what you gain. And there's a variety of things you can get. And to check to see what your dice do, you can look at the back side of your board here. Um, and of course the rule book, which will explain them. Uh, sometimes you're gonna get helping markers. Other times you can gain virtue or maybe even uh, pigment or paint markers. Uh, you can gain sin or virtues, which are these little markers here, which you will basically gather all this stuff and place it on your game board. The help and pigment are going to be used for a variety of different things. The resources that you can place on your board here. If you gain a virtue, you will place it face down on your board on the virtue spot. If you gain a sin, you will place it face down on your sin slot. Um, and you can also gain victory points. If your marker comes with a two, you just go ahead and go up two on this track here. After the resource phase is over, after the resource phase is over, then you will flip over your virtues and sins, and these are going to give you kind of game rules that you must follow for as long as they remain on your game board. If you ever get three, that's your max for each virtue and sin, and if you gain more, you'll lose the bottom one and put in a new one. Resource phase is now over, so now we're going to move on to the action phase. An action is going to be one of two things. It's either going to be placing one of your die as an action on the game board or taking a free action. A free action can come in the form of perhaps a virtue or sin, could come in the form of a card that you've gained by playing or creating an icon. Um, and then the main actions are to take any of these die and place them in the allotted slots. And there's a wide variety of, the, wide variety of these. The first one here is to place a uh, paint blue die or a pigment blue die on one of the two areas on this specific board here. Um, if you place it on the paint section, you are going to need to spend the correct amount of pigments as well as the correct amount of tokens, uh, which you can take a look at on your, your main uh, board here. This is your player board here, which will determine, okay, you need to have in order to create a white robe, one blue token and four white pigments. And that's all you need to do. You can actually take the specific white robe and place it on your icon, and you will gain the ability of when it's placed. Additionally, when building out your icon, once you have built the whole thing, you'll score for it. And then every single time you upgrade it by building something different, like, okay, well, I built the white robe, now I want to upgrade to the green robe, you're going to score again. And you'll score all the points as soon as the thing has been built. There's a whole bunch of things that go into building this icon as far as putting rubies on it and upgrading it to its like highest, most virtuous state. But the only thing you really need to know right now is basically that you can place an icon, a token on here, or your die on here, um, and then spend the resources to build this guy out. The next section here is the pigment. This is basically going to allow you to place a blue pigment die on here um, with these exact symbols showing. And then you can choose one of these areas here. There's a wide variety of areas. You have like the white, the green pigments, the, the red and the blue. You have the two areas where you can gain gold. Um, and then you have a place where you can gain rubies. Placing the die and then placing one of your like exertion tokens, the blue ones here, um, are going to allow you to gain the pigments, but you're also going to have to lose or gain exertion on your board. That's the hand, it's like the hard work. Every time you make pigment, it requires hard work, so you'll push this across. And if you do gold or rubies, they're gonna be two. It's gonna be extra hard. The next space is going to be an orange die and you can place on any of these areas here. If they have an X, only one die can be put there. If they have a scaling graph, you can place 
die there, but every time you place a new die, you have to add an extra one. So I place a die, you have to place two. You place two, Jim has to place three. And if it has an infinity symbol, then you can go ahead and place as many die there as you'd like, no matter how many players are there. This board here is going to give you virtue, it's going to give you victory points, it'll let you go up on the bell tower, and you can remove sins from it. The next area is the whiteboard here. This is going to allow you to gain hearts, um, it, um, as, as well as the painting tokens, um, exertion, and then you can also use other players' abilities. This is a cool one. This is like I call it the wooden church. You can use either blue or white die, and these are locations that only one die can go on, but you have to start from the top and go to the right, and then go to the bottom and go to the right. And each space is consecutively worth more points, and they're are worth more value, I should say, and anybody can place them on here up until the very end. The bottom area here is the bell tower. This is the area in which you're gonna gain more dice. More dice is basically like more workers. It's very powerful. And you're only gonna be able to place orange die on it. You'll also have to, uh, uh, you'll have to have to do the sleepy symbol, move it to the right one, which will then let you have fewer dice the next turn. Um, but you'll be able to go up on this tower. You'll use one of your tokens on the bottom left and move up onto the tower. Whenever you hit the red portions of the game board by following the lines, uh, you're going to gain new dice that you can use or draft in the next round. This area is the helping board, or the I should not the helping board. This is the um, the chores board. Basically, they're objectives. When you complete an objective on this board here on your turn, you can take one of these guys here. Uh, you're going to gain the die for the rest of the game and place it on your board in the slotted areas with coins. These are dice that will remain, but you may only ever have two of them, and they're basically going to be handed into your draft. If you ever gain extra die in any other way that are not from the calculations of your red marker, and if you've gained a chore or two, uh, then they're going to go away, but these stay forever. Super, super useful. Uh, the, uh, this, this right hand side over here is the, uh, the monks. These are the guys that you're going to be talking to and working with. You can choose to summon them and you can choose to chat with them. If you summon them, you'll need a white die and you'll have to take a gossip. So what, it's the, the middle one of these red markers here that can make you discard help tokens. Gossiping isn't really, it's kind of frowned upon. When you summon them, you'll do whatever the top portion is. After you've summoned them, you'll place them down below. And now you can choose to um, do the bottom portion, which is you can talk to them, you can chat. But you're gonna, you can play any die as opposed to just the white one, and it will not cost you a uh, gossip. And they'll take this and you'll use this ability. And as you summon them, they'll start placing them on this board here. And eventually, when this board starts filling up, then you're going to start removing them. If you're playing with just a two-player game, you're only going to have two slots in it, and these, these guys are going to change based on the round. As new... Uh, as new rounds come come through and you come from the uh, one, two, and then three here, uh, then you're going to take these guys here and you're also going to switch decks, etc., etc. Anyway, those are all the places in which you can place out your dice and utilize them. And once everybody has used all their dice one at a time, I use a die, you use a die, I take a free action, you use a die, I take a die, then we're done. Once everybody has passed, basically, it will move on to the next phase of the game, which is the fresco. Now, this is where you're going to have uh, this board here. As you go throughout the game, you're going to gain pigments from your die, and they're going to go onto your board. If you do not need them or do not want them, you can sell them, basically, or basically gift them. And when you do so, you'll move your marker on this track. As you move your marker on the track, you're going to move the like community marker on the track. Each phase of the game is going to have a number, which is going to, be one, which is going to want to be met. In this phase here, uh, if it's a two-player around the phase one, it's going to be six. So if you manage to get six or more, then you're going to score once the die uh, passes. One, two, three, on, on this last round. Once it passes that last round, you will score points based on how far your marker is. If you do not meet the threshold, though, you're going to get half points for every resource you get rid of. I would suggest using this. If you have extra resources that you don't, don't need, I wouldn't super, super focus on it, but you can get some good, good victory points from it. The last phase of the game before cleanup is the abbot's uh, anger. This phase here, basically the abbot has seen all your pigments that you're taking and hoarding and stuff like that, and you'll have to move them down on your track on your game board. This game board is going to have pigments that you'll start with on the top of your player board, and you'll have to move it down one. You'll also check all these red markers here, and 
it, do whatever they say, whether it be on the next phase you take less dice, or you can discard X help tokens, or you have to make your pigments move down extra steps, then you'll do that kind of stuff. Luckily, you have a thing called Virtue. It is your green die. For every single one of these red markers that you have up a space, you can spend a Virtue, one, two, three, to move down one of these negative things like uh, a gossip or fatigue. And eventually, hopefully, you can get all these guys down. At the end of the game, Virtue is worth points, but really you wanna use it to make sure that none of these other things that you've done are too, uh, uh, too, you don't want them to hurt you too badly. After this phase, the next round will continue. We'll go. You'll move this little marker here. You'll take off all the dice that have been placed on the game board, um, and then you will rinse and repeat. There are certain phases in which you're going to check this board here to see if you've met the threshold, and there's also certain portions of the game where you're going to switch these decks here to change out the monks. At the end of the seventh round, it's time to calculate points. And you're going to calculate points based on some unique aspects to your... Uh, your icon here, uh, whether you've placed rubies on it and whatnot, and there's certain headdresses uh, that only are going to give you the ability to place a ruby. And there's one that's a really fancy one that you place three here. And angels. Speaking of angels, I forgot to mention, there is an angel board over here. Now, this guy here, this board here with all these little angels on it, uh, these you don't want to use until you're certain you're no longer going to increase your uh, headdress. Basically, at the end of the game, you can either place one to four dice on these spaces here and take the angel and gain the benefit. You could choose to do the early ones sooner to gain you a benefit earlier in the game, but you'll basically just be placing them directly on these, these here. And they also let you score extra, again, whenever you place them on here. Um, and they're just higher scoring tools that you can use at the end of the game. Every time you score with this, you'll score five extra points. Um, or once per round, first die placed on the tower bell moves the tracker by four steps. Well, pretty useful. Anyway, that's the basic idea of the game though. It's a dice drafting game. You're collecting dice, you're rolling the dice, gaining the resources, and then we go around taking actions, whether they be free or the dice, Check to see what resources you don't want and dump them. Check to see how mad the abbot is at you and make your pigments kind of like depreciate in, in quality. And then after that, rinse and repeat. Highest points is the winner. Icons of Keep, what do I think? So who doesn't love to create a beautiful painting? A straight up work of art. I simply do. And that's what you're basically doing in this game. You're basically crafting and trying to gather the required tools in order to create your, your icons, your beautiful, fabulous icons. Uh, and you're willing to do that in any way you possibly can. Stopping other monks from gaining the certain pigments that you that they want, that you need. Um, going up on the bell tower to gain extra dice, because as we all know, extra dice, just like extra workers, means extra turns. And if you can jump ahead quick enough on other players, you can start taking seven dice well they're still left with three or even four it's possible and because of that this game can be a little bit cutthroat you wouldn't think so with monks in a monastery but eh, there you have it you also have this really cool aspect where you have the chore board these are like hey i want you to do the thing and then you do the thing and you get a bonus action love it if you can get two of them oh you're off to the races and while these boards that give you dice don't give you a whole lot of victory points they will generate you a value throughout the game to give you the ability to make your icon there's a few slight things that you can do on the board the bell tower if you get to the very 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 end and you get those seven actions you can actually get well you can never get three dice, somebody's never gonna get three compared to seven, but it's possible you get at least two or three other actions above another player. But if you get to the very end here, you can get 20 bonus points. It's pretty useful, right? Pretty useful. But this is your main scoring method, upgrading the different ropes and trying to basically create this beautiful headdress, uh, starting to switch it out so that you can start placing these rubies on them because these guys at the end of the game are worth 15 points. And the other way you can score at the end of the game too is, like I said, virtue, you get an extra one or two, po one, one point for each one of these like spaces it moves across, but you'll lose points for any of the red areas. So it's always worth it to just push them down. I love the action game in this game. I love the rounds. I love the synergy. I love the idea that you are going to have little changes from uh, round to round, as well as gaining new die in the pool as you obtain more and more dice. Um, 
It's really, really straightforward game. It has a lot of complexity to it. It kind of reminds me of a board and dice game where there's a lot of complexity, a lot of things to do, a lot of areas to go. I even forgot to do talk about the angels almost. So that's how much stuff there is to do. But everything is very simple. Once you understand one or two boards, you pretty much understand all of them. The main unique ones are the angel board and the, the chore area here and the bell tower. But all these guys are pretty simple or yeah, even this one here, place the die of the color in the area as long as you're able to and gain the benefit. Some of them have a requirement that will make you suffer a penalty and others you can place that as much as you want, etc., etc. And it, it really just really, really flows and works. Uh, that being said, you have to be careful not to let your opponent steamroll you. You have to watch to see what they're doing and what dice they are drafting and get a sense of where they want to go. It could be dangerous if you both want to go to the blue area to gain pigments if a, each player is gathering these blue dice and blocking each other off to make them spend more resources as well as, of course, get their hands a little extra dirty. Um, the game also has this kind of feature where you have pigments that go onto your main game board and every round they basically start lowering in value. And if you get too low on the, the board here, you'll lose dice for the next round. It's pretty challenging to actually lose dice if you do not want to, but if you want to keep resources, you might have to. So there's kind of this balancing act going throughout the whole game where I need to have two green, two red, two white, and two blue and three of these tokens here to make a blue robe. Sadly, my green is now down on the area where I'm going to lose a die, but I need to keep that green for the next round so that I can basically build this. So I will lose that die. That's typically how that's going to happen. So it's, it even feels like choice in that regard. Um, this area here where you can start spending and whatnot, this is going to be probably more used in a larger player game where players have those extra resources or where people are actually trying to work together in attempts to push the resources far enough so that only they gain victory points. And there's kind of this like little team aspect that can kind of be brought uh, with the specific phase of the game, the fresco phase, where you're trying to push this board along to score the unique uh, values or the, like to hit those thresholds to gain the victory points. I love this game. It's cute, it's fun, it's vibrant, and the ability to build stuff, the ability to roll and change your outcome, the sins and virtues are super cool. They basically can give you unique abilities throughout the game, or they can be tremendously difficult. You cannot get help tokens. Wow, that's... That's rough. But there's ways in which you can exchange them. There's ways in which you can get rid of them. You can go to certain areas on the game board and remove them. Um, and then there's also uh, cards in the game as well. When you build certain types of robes, you'll be able to gather from one of these decks here. And these decks provide unique cards with abilities. Some of them are just free abilities that you discard. Uh, sometimes they will require help tokens. There's a lot of things in this game that require help tokens. Um, and you can utilize them in order to gain their benefit. Use the chat ability of a brother in the farmyard that hasn't been occupied yet. And so you can just simply do this as a free action by spending help. You don't need to spend any dice. And these can be very, very beneficial. Give you a little bit of a boost in the game as well as even victory points as you build this. Building this is the most important thing. It's pretty much stated throughout the rule book and it's, you, you know that's what you need to do even probably like a third of the way through the game. That's how you gain all the victory points. But there are some unique little ways to catch up, especially if you run out of resources or pigments or not enough die to gain those points. You can kind of look around the board and suss out what brother might be able to help you. The brother's going to help out. Or over here, it might be the, uh, the bell tower where you can get all the way to the, to the top to score those extra 20. And that all kind of works out in this game. And it feels and it flows really well, as long as you don't mind a game that can get run away from you. Um, and a game that obviously the more you play, the better you get at it and like kind of construct where you want to go and how you want to use it. And that's for a lot of games, but this one specifically. Then you're going to really enjoy Icons of Kiev. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, high quality looking game. And I'm excited to show you guys when it hits Kickstarter, there's a link down below in the description. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review of the game, Icons of Kiev. If you're interested, there's a link down below, like I said. And if you really, really appreciate my videos, hit that subscribe button and the bell notification button. Those greatly help us out. It keeps us making more and more to make more videos here. You can also share our uh, website on filtergamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. Our live streams are on Wednesdays and Sundays, Wednesdays, whatnot, and Sundays, 6 30 p.m. PST is on all the platforms. Well, that's pretty much all I got for you this time, guys. And as always, I look forward to helping craft the monastery with you next time. But my icon is gonna look better.